Meet Robert and Steve, the Horror of the Dark Podcast, and the Sacra Judges. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of the Horror After Dark podcast in the Sacra JT. You get to hop right in the bed with me here and talk movies. So, this film, let me start off with that. I've heard about this movie over the years. And I never pulled the trigger on seeing it. I don't know if part of it has to do with... Nothing against Mia Farrow, but... I'm not a fan of Rosemary's Baby. And I know a few friends and people who feel the same way. It's it's a classic. It's, I think it's a well-made film. But it's so fucking boring for me. I can't take it. I've seen it a few times. I've tried. It doesn't work for me. So this is another film that's in that type of real slow burn. And I love slow burn horror. It has nothing to do with it. It's just that movie in particular for some reason, does nothing for me. This film hits every fucking mark, and I'm ashamed that I haven't seen this movie until recently, like a month ago, because, like I said, I've heard about it. The Haunting of Julia we're talking about, obviously. It's also known as Full Circle in the UK and other regions, but... This was based off of a Peter Straub novel called Julia, which I'm not too familiar with Straub's work, but I I do have The Talisman, which was him and Stephen King wrote that together. I've had it for 10 years, that book. I've never read it. (laughs) So I don't know how it is, but this movie is genuinely terrifying. Like, I've, uh, this movie, I've also heard many, many good things from my buddy Lorne, and he quotes this as the scariest movie ever made. And could I say that? Um, but it's fucking terrifying. This is a terrifying film, especially that it hits on personal things like, you know, the main character here of Julia loses her child, her daughter. In the beginning of this film and as a father who has a young daughter the intro to this movie just absolutely guts me like just seeing her and it's effective and just seeing her choking at the at the you know the kitchen table and julia and 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 magnus the husband just have they're freaking out they call the ambulance but the ambulance ain't gonna get there in time and she starts to give him give her a tracheotomy to try to stop her from choking and to save her daughter's life and she dies like due to her trying the tracheotomy so just the guilt that this woman must feel i mean she tried saving her daughter's life i mean i get it she didn't do anything wrong and i looked into it because the first thing i thought was why don't they do the heimlich maneuver and i'm sure people who have seen this have thought that Immediately, I thought maybe it wasn't as well known back then, and it turns out that's what it was. That uh, the Heimlich maneuver was, I think, written about and published by Heimlich or whatever the fuck his name was. And um, pretty sure it was Heimlich, right? It's his maneuver, <laughs> so it would make sense that it's him. But seventy-five-ish, I think, is when he published that, and then the American Red Cross and everything didn't start putting it out in like choking hazard prevention and stuff until 76 so this was filmed in 76 and so the Heimlich maneuver was not well known widely throughout you know the public and stuff so it does make sense because that was the first thing I thought I was like why isn't she trying the Heimlich maneuver and then I thought of that I looked into it so that's exactly why if anyone is wondering that but let's talk Haunting of Julia aka Full Circle from 1977 which is just a fucking golden year for horror man I mentioned it in my top uh, films of the 70s which this movie instantly made I think the top five or number six or something like that of the 70s for me with one watch so that's how fucking amazing this movie is Mia Farrow does an amazing performance I mean it seems just like how she is in Rosemary's Baby but she does a fine performance in that movie too it's just the movie don't work for me here it does and her performance is great and just the whole way of looking at this film in two different ways 
that it is an actual haunting that and I love the title I mean how can you not love the title too both of them work full circle works we'll get into that but haunting of Julia the haunting of her guilt the haunting of her grief the haunting of her suffering and stuff that just drives her to committing suicide in the end or she's actually being haunted by this ghost girl and she ends up killing her in the end it's it's handled so well i mean we've seen stuff like this before but this is 77 and this was just handled so well in this movie just how you can look at it in uh, more ways than those two actually but really fascinating let's talk about it so the reason i decided to do a podcast of, of this instead of a video is because i have the film on my computer this movie apparently was released in the in the 80s late 80s on VHS and has not had a digital release like a physical release since then until like a year ago or this year or something recent like that Lauren if you hear this you can put in the comments correct me but um this is apparently apparently a very hard movie to find before um very recently and probably the reason I never I mean, fucking saw it <laughs> because you don't see this movie like you know anywhere you don't really see it on tv ever it's never a title that i saw on tv growing up but damn am i glad i saw it now the first thing i gotta talk about with this movie is the goddamn music man the score by colin towns in this film is so eerie it's so hauntingly gorgeous it is perfect like, if I had to go back and do my uh, top film scores, like horror film scores, this would instantly be in the top ten. Instantly, if not higher. The music works so well for this. And as a huge progressive rock fan, my whole life basically, it sounds very progish. Like, it sounds, it's great piano and then just synthesizers over it that sound like it could be from an early Yes album, Rick Wakeman era or like Keith Emerson or something like that. Like it sounds so good and it's used to amazing effect throughout this whole film, especially at the end when we just get the amazing shots of Julia dead in the, in the uh, chair and panning around her and the music kicks in and then the credits, it's so fucking good. The score by Colin Downs, absolutely amazing in this. Man, I gotta definitely do a guitar cover of the theme song in this fucking movie because it is so goddamn good like I know I'm going to be talking about the score a bit but it's almost like Candyman level Philip Glass's score from there especially the uh, it's always been you Helen that piece which is one of my favorite compositions in a film ever almost like that with this film with the music it elevates it so much and it's, it's just absolutely perfect so well done so julia looks like not julia uh kate her daughter looks around 11 12 ish maybe because my daughter's my daughter's 10 next year and she's this girl seems a little bit older so i'm gonna say like 11 12 unless they mention it i don't remember but oh this whole opening scene man just having just something is so something so easy that can happen as choking from something so natural and integral to survival for us as eating that can just kill an innocent kid like this is such a terrifying thought man <laughs> like that that it's that it's that easy that someone you, you've heard the the story someone chokes on a fucking piece of broccoli and and that's it they're dead and they could have been like a raving criminal drug addict alcoholic their entire life you'd be like this is the motherfucker who lives when good people are dying all the time you know the type of people i'm talking about uh, then they end up choking on a piece of fucking celery and they're dead they're like <laughs> <laughs> that's how it feels in this opening scene but just so much more tragic because it's a child and just the shot of Mia Farrow of Julia just shaking in the doorway when help comes the ambulance and she has blood on her and she's trembling from just failing to save her daughter's life by giving her a fucking tracheotomy great shots and oh you feel her fucking pain right there with the score kicking with those shots of her standing in the door with the blood. Oh, great. Now, one thing I thought was very odd on my first watch of this 
Maybe I'll pick up on something here, but... And maybe it's explained in the book. I don't know. Her husband, Magnus, they separate shortly after uh, the death of their daughter, Kate. This whole movie, he's, like, harassing her to get back together. I don't know why. Is there a reason for that? It seems like she's well off financially. Like, she's able to leave him and just leave, get a nice fucking apartment somewhere. Like, she's seems like she's well off, and she signs documents in the beginning here that make it seem like she has a trust or something like that. So is he just after her money? Because that's what I'm thinking. He doesn't even seem... He doesn't care. His kid's dead. Like, he just wants to get back with her and get the money, I'm guessing. I'm, that's what I can take from it, unless it's something I missed that I'll pick up on. And not apartment, a, a house she's able to just buy. So... I'm guessing it's just a money thing with uh, Magnus tr constantly, all movie, trying to get back with her. And it's a crime, man, that this movie's not more well known. It really is. But it is a very artsy film. It's an art film, long, slow burn, and that's just not for everybody. I love it. And this just works so well. But I can definitely see why this didn't get as popular in the horror lexicon in history than it, than it should because this movie deserves so much more attention and so much more being talked about because it's a crime that is not as well known. We see the toy, the wind-up toy of Kate that Julia brought to the, her new house with her that plays an integral role in the movie which is what ends up killing her at the end of the movie. Did she slash her throat with it herself or... Was it the ghost that kills her? We'll talk more about that. But first, a little musical cue from our sponsor, Wesley Willis. Rest in peace, buddy. All right, and we're back after some Wesley Willis. If you don't know who Wesley Willis is, check him out. Because it's actually kind of inspiring, the story around him. But this has nothing to do with the movie. See, and this is what I mean by it being, like, not for everybody, this movie. And it being very artsy, slow burnish. There's a lot of sh lingering shots with the score in the background. There's a lot of establishing shots there's a there's a lot of that and that just unfortunately especially for the younger generation today it just it doesn't work for them which is so unfortunate but that's the type of movie this is like there's definitely some downtime but if it's working for you it's gonna work for you all right now this is interesting what's with the heater i remember from the first watch that a few times the heater in her room turns on and then she goes and turns it back off and she finally unplugs it if I remember correctly a little later so is this the ghost that's turning it on is she turning it on and forgetting because she's so you know grief stricken and depressed and everything like that is it just a faulty heater like, there's, there's so many avenues you can go down dissecting this movie, and that's why it needs to be talked about more. Because I'll shed some light on how I take this now. I look at this more as it wasn't an actual haunting. I look at this as a very depressed and grief-stricken woman who descends into insanity, pretty much, and ends up killing herself because she killed her daughter in her eyes that's how i take this film you could look at it both ways of course and am i right probably not it probably is meant to be an actual haunting over the 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 alternative but for me and especially that i reading a little bit into this mia farrow said that she want she approached this role more of a woman descending into you know insanity or like psychologically degrading over time and not your average supernatural horror movie 
So that makes me think the way that she was thinking that she played this role, that there's a big possibility that that's actually what happens here. Is that she, there's no ghost. She just hears these stories as she's investigating and starts finding out about the, the boy, the German uh, boy who was killed. And the female ghost, I'm blanking on her name right now, but Olivia, is that it? The, the one who, the evil ghost who's supposed to be haunting her. With all of her grief and suffering and everything and her state of mind, hearing all of these weird stories, she starts having delusions and think, she starts believing in this. And in the end, she can't take it anymore and she kills herself. That's how I look at this. Let me know how you guys view this movie. If you view it towards the supernatural way or the more psychological way that I lean. Interested to hear. Okay, now integral scene here in the park we have her sitting on the bench in the park and she ends up seeing what she thinks is her daughter Kate like playing in the sand but it doesn't look like the actress who played Kate in the very beginning the daughter it looks like the the ghost girl I keep wanting to say Olivia but I'm not sure it looks like her it's, you only see her hair but when you see her later it looks just like her so is she seeing the ghost here? If you want to subscribe to, you know, the whole paranormal side of this movie. Because then she picks up the turtle in the sand. And there's a knife with the turtle. And the turtle was killed. And the woman freaks out on her and says, you know, get out of here. I'll call the cops. And says, did you touch my son and everything? So did she, was that in there already? Or did she kill that turtle? Because if you want to go down the paranormal route here, I remember later in the film when they're talking about Olivia, <laughs> I'm open, the ghost girl, that she was evil and that all the people that she influenced killed an animal. So is this her influencing Julia? Let me know. Now we have a great seance scene. And now this is what makes me flip-flop from the you know, mentally falling into insanity and killing herself versus the ghost haunting, is that there is a seance. A seance has taken place. The woman, uh, I forget her name, Mrs. Fled or something like that, the old woman, she sees a vision, and she says that it was a girl. So maybe there is a ghost. It's just I love movies like this, that you can go either way with two different branching ways that you can look at the storyline. And yo, if that bitch just talked to my kid or saw a vision and stuff, I would not let her fall asleep. I'd smack that old woman and wake her up. Yo, tell me what you fucking saw, lady, <laughs> before you take a nap. You could die after this and just let me know what happened. Are you serious? It's my kid. I mean, we see how just alone and lonely she is. She's spending her day building a house of cards. Do you know how fucking bored you gotta get to build a house of cards on your floor? I am very bored and lazy sometimes. I have never built a house of anything, but <laughs> especially a house of cards. I pick up a guitar, I watch a movie, I do something. Go out, hang out. Never ever have I built a house of cards. So this woman is super lonely. Yeah, like Magnus. Like he's ready. He's trying to break into her house, <laughs> and this guy comes and he's like, "Yo, I think you should leave." And like, what are you doing? If she's not home, you should leave. And he says he's going to call the cops. Why does Magnus want? So and then he just shoves this guy's ass down to the ground. <laughs> Like, why? Wait, I really want to know if it's just the money thing, or is there something else? Because that's all it seems like, is that this is just a money-hungry dick, and that's all he cares about. Doesn't care about the death of his child, doesn't care about his wife's well-being, or his ex-wife, whatever. Just wants the money. And with, like, a lot of films from back in the 70s and 60s, 70s, 80s even... I just love the long scenes, just this, the minimal cuts in this, like, everything today, like the Marvel films, everything, mainstream movies, is just cuts every fucking second, it, it cut, 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 
it's it's so maddening like, to the point that you don't even know what the hell's going on. I miss cinema back in the days here. That it's just a scene and it did no cuts or very minimal cutting, and you can just watch a conversation and you just. I don't know. It's just, maybe it's me. I miss that. I love that in movies. I, I can't stand how many cuts are in films today. And then Magnus meets his demise, which let's start building proof here now. We don't see anything. He's creeping around the house in the basement, and he gets shoved down the stairs. Or he falls down the stairs. We don't see a ghost. We don't see anything. We, so it's, we know Julia doesn't kill him. So we can put that out. Was it the ghost? Or did he just trip and fall? But the light does go out afterwards. That's the kicker there. The light bulb goes out. So I'm starting to lean a little more towards the ghost angle. But let's see uh, as we keep going here. Now, I've said a few times on the channel that I think Argento and... Lynch are the like two directors that can make death just look gorgeous and beautiful and tragic at the same time. And Lon Crane does a phenomenal job in this movie. With, like the whole scene with Magnus falling and then just the blood dripping and the the score kicking in. It it looks gorgeous. It's terrifying. It's it's amazing. And now for the weather, uh, Meatwad, what's the weather like in New York? Well, it's, it's about 62 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's, it's a little bit sunny outside, let's we'll go outside and get some sun. That sounds great, man, that's a good day out there. Well, it's a little good over here, too, I'm hanging out my door, hi, banana, Ooh, my dog, <laughs> hello, my dog. Okay, buddy, nice to talk to you soon. All right, don't tell you, take care now. Goodbye, Meatwad. Again, with Julia, with this old woman, Miss Fledge, or whatever the fuck her name is, she just said, like, the other night, like, this is, again, it's your kid that this woman apparently saw a vision of. Wake this woman up. What, has she been in a coma the last two days? Three days? Like, you couldn't come see her sooner? Like I said, I would have smacked her up <laughs> as soon as she fell asleep. But this woman just, like, really takes her time stewing on mystery when she could find out. I love now when we find Julia researching about the German boy who was murdered in the park. And he, she goes to talk to the mother. Great actress. I've seen her before. I can't think of what. Great performance here in this little role. But she is angry, man. Like, <laughs> she's fucking angry. And she knows that the vagrant that was caught and arrested for killing her son was innocent. And it wasn't him. That it was these young kids, including the girl who the ghost in this film made him kill an animal and then i'm pretty sure they cast the girl castrates him castrated him back then which man this bitch is evil man some of the pianos the grand pianos in this guy's place one of the guys that uh you know bullied and beat up and almost and basically was involved in the killing of this kid his showroom here some amazing looking pianos man some beautiful wood just thought you should know. And this motherfucker's guilty of sin. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, oh, I don't remember him. Oh, well, yeah, I remember him. But then, like, all right, time for you to leave now, lady. I'm like, guy's guilty as a fuck. Kerr, who is guilty. The other guy she goes to see next kind of looks in one shot. Looks like Billy Joel with a bunch of facial hair and longer hair. Maybe it's just me. All right, yeah, Olivia's the name. All right. Whew, crisis averted. And, your know, life experience here. Never trust a bitch named Olivia. <laughs> I'm just saying. I got stories. Don't trust Olivia's. Now I'm definitely leaning on the side. This bitch is the ghost and she killed her. And this guy she's talking to, the second dude, he's just spewing all this information out. Like, <laughs> like he's not in the least bit concerned about her going to the police and telling him everything that he just said and then having it looked into and the, at nothing. Like, this guy's just like willy-nilly, here you go, here's all this information on this death I was, like, part of. Again, with the heater on, and she unplugs it. So, ghosts turning it on. It's Olivia turning it on is what I'm going to guess. God fucking damn, man. Again, the score is just phenomenal. And then, okay, so then we have her friend Mark, the only friend in the world it seems like she has. <laughs> and he's taking a bath. 
and then the window opens slightly and knocks the lamp into the bathtub and electrocutes him to death. Again, accident or Olivia. Now, that's never made clear if this ghost of Olivia is contained to the house. I would think that it would probably extend to the park, and that's why she sees her there, because that's where Jeffrey was killed, the kid. So I'm guessing maybe it extends to around, like, an area around the park and stuff, so maybe she can come over to Mark's place here and kill him? I don't know. Another thing that's unexplained and uh, is fun to uh, think about. The whole scene with Olivia's mother and Julia, excellent. So good. I love it. I love the dynamic between them. I love the dialogue between them. I love the old woman saying how her daughter Olivia was friggin' evil. And that she, she choked on her food, too. And let, and let her basically smother her. Let her choke to death. And it all comes full circle to how Julia's child died, which great title for the UK and everywhere else. But such a great scene. And then we see... As she, Julia is leaving, when Julia turns to the mother, we see Olivia's eyes, and it gives her a heart attack. The mother, she ends up just having a fucking heart attack from fright in her chair. So she had to have seen Olivia's eyes, right? Had to have seen it for her to have, unless she just had an untimely heart attack and just died coincidentally. But now the coincidences are starting to starting to stack up a bit. Between Magnus, Mark, and now her having a heart attack? Hmm. Interesting. Man, I love that white car that drops her off. And then we just come to the amazing ending here, where she walks downstairs, and she sees Olivia's ghost sitting there with the toy, the wind-up uh, toy that Kate loved. And Julia sits down, and the score fucking kicks in, man, and it's so good. And she says... Everything is okay now. Stay with me. So is she looking at her as her daughter, Kate? Or does she know that this is Olivia? This ghost of this dead evil girl? Does she just want any type of company at this point? Like, it's like at this point, anything. Like, stay with me, whoever you are. You're a kid. It, it works. <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're a kid like my daughter was. Stay with me. Or... Does she view her as her daughter and that she's so whacked out? And then she says, come. And that's when we just finally see her with her throat slit, the blood coming down with the piano and then the synths come in. And, oh, it's so fucking fantastic. And she, that's it. She's dead. So let's go through this here. We have the heater thing, which keeps turning on unexplainably. That could be a coincidence. But then we have Magnus tripping and dying. We have Mark getting electrocuted. And we have the mother of Olivia dying of a heart attack and <laughs> induced by fright from seeing Olivia's eyes. But it's so great just looking at it as her killing herself from just going through all of this. And then we just have it, the credits roll as it lingers on the shots of her dead in the chair. At the score going, doing its thing amazingly. Oh, this movie's fantastic. Why did I not see it over all these years? And this is Mia Farrow's redemption movie for me for never liking Rosemary's Baby. But excellent movie. If you guys haven't seen it, seek it out. Or, um, like I said, I'm pretty sure it just recently got a release or is getting a release physically. So, The Haunting of Julia, 1977. Excellent, absolute masterpiece of a movie. And, alright guys, I will talk to you soon. We hit 500 subs today. That is awesome. Thank you to everybody who has supported the channel in any way, shape, or form. And I hope everyone is having a good morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you're from. And I will talk to you soon. Take care, guys.